Hi, I'm Alan Murdoch. For the past 20 years, I've been buying, fixing, and selling properties right here in Southern Arizona. And I want to buy your property. Whether it's a house, apartment, commercial building, or vacant land, regardless of the condition or the situation, I want to talk to you. When you sell to me, I pay cash and it's hassle-free. No repairs, no closing costs, and no commissions. If you have a property you don't want to deal with and you want a quick solution, call, text, or visit SellTalon.com. Again, that's SellTalon.com. Copper Creek Cookies, Copper Creek Cookies, Copper Creek Cookies.net. We can print anything on our soft vanilla logo cookies. We deliver them and other sweet treats locally. We are located at 4249 West Ina Road, Suite 121. Call us, 520-300-1131. We make smiles. Copper Creek Cookies, Copper Creek Cookies, Copper Creek Cookies.net. <clears throat> it's the first time I've had one of these. This Notes? thick, four pages. Usually oh, I'll so have I... like a one, a one. Uh, this is awesome. Yeah, this so is I, great. I just, you don't, have you to don't mess around, anything. man. This I is just, great. I love it. I actually, I was, I was frustrated too because I did a, a podcast last year where I typed up a bunch of notes, but I didn't take that with me when I retired. Yeah, I was like transferring all these files, you know, photos and notes and powerpoints and public record documents, things that I could share, not case-related stuff. Can't do that. Yeah. But then all of a sudden I looked at my files. I'm like, oh, I don't have that list of questions. Because it – so I had just had I had to crank this out real yeah. quick. But it didn't take Real quick. <laughs> well, I mean, because, well, like the, the, the numbered ones from like one to whatever, I already had – those are from a previous interview. I just do the files. I'm just I'm, I'm just complimenting you on your organizational well, stuff, thank you. man. It's well, just, it's, it's I'm an accountant. Like that's the thing. I mean, we are – we're just – paper intensive i'm married to one i feel this yeah, i know what I you're mean, saying it's, we're <laughs> we're very type a we're very organized um, mm-hmm. very detail oriented absolutely um those are the type of people that we wanted to hire yeah um, because we are with irs criminal investigation the nerdiest of the law enforcement agencies I mean, just probably like, yeah i mean it's it's we're just our cases are the most cerebral Mm-hmm. But that's also the reason why we have the highest percentage of females in law enforcement. We're at 25%. No other federal agency, I mean, FBI might be at 20. Mm-hmm. But then if you think about it, you know, DEA, Border Patrol, those are going to even be lower. Yeah. Just because of the nature of the job. And then are you familiar with the 30 by 30 um, push for women in law enforcement, both federal and locally? No, it's I'm kind not. of a It's kind of a thing. Um, and I know um, I heard... Chief Kazmar from TPD talk about it. So, I mean, you could look it up online. Mm -hmm. But there's just a push to get more women in law enforcement. There should be. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, you you want a nice mix of people. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I've always been told with women in law enforcement is women are better at multitasking and they're better at diffusing situations. Right. Where sometimes, you know how it is, you get some guy and a cop and they just, they keep escalating. Kickstarters. You know, know, (laughs) and where sometimes you need someone to bring it down. Yeah. But then, you know, likewise, it's nice to be six foot four and 250 male dealing with a situation where that's sometimes the disadvantage for females is the Mm -hmm. size, you know? Yeah. I mean, part of the reason I never even considered going into local law enforcement is I was always short, skinny kid with, I mean, I've worked out all my life. Look how skinny my arms are, you know? (laughs) Like, I don't want to be scrum, you know? Yeah. That's why I ended up, you know, going the federal route. Yeah. You know, because I was a runner. I was like literally, you know, like, a hundred pound runner in high school. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah. Never really envisioned myself being a straight cop. Yeah. Cause I'm sure you've gotten into some scraps. Yeah. You know what? Fortunately, not like the craziest ones, mm-hmm. you know? So before I became a street cop, I worked corrections. All right. You mentioned yeah, that. So I did, I did four years at the state as a corrections officer. And which, which prisons? The Wilmot pr- complex over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I worked a couple units there and, That was the most valuable experience I got because it taught me how to communicate with the worst of the worst, Mm -hmm. right? You're communicating with your staff as well. And uh, you you can become a leader to the population, but also to your staff as well. So I thought that was... That was very, very important for mm. me to learn. And then going... People skills, yeah. Yeah. I was able to do a lot more here and here than with, with these oh, and course. the tools, you know. And, and that's right. most police work, but... Well, and a lot of it there is respect. Yeah. And you get people to... And you'll 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 respect this and know this, yeah. is you'll get people to admit to crimes just with really good conversation <laughs> like we're having right now. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, I totally did that. And then you're like, 
oh sweet that's on film and on you know it's recorded so you know that and yeah uh, yeah so yeah you could get you could solve cases just with really good communication as opposed to uh, where's the camera view at well, who was there you rapport know? yeah just building a rapport and trust so oh, yeah so you did that for four years and then but the square time is like scrapping like, yeah scrapping so, so streets street i think my worst scrapping probably happened in the prison yeah, on the street it wasn't too much. I had I worked at the high school. I had one kid that kind of got crazy in one of the bathrooms. And I, you had to take I, him I, down by yourself. Yeah, I snuck in there and he was doing something he shouldn't have been doing, and uh, didn't want to didn't want to comply at all. So we had to have a little redirection to yeah, yeah. to the wall and some well, stuff. Some, some police officers <laughs> love that, you yeah. know they they love the you know mixing it up a little bit, you know, because yeah. you're actually doing police work mm-hmm. and stuff. For us, you know, at IRS, I mean, there's very few times where we actually went hands on more than just putting on the cuffs. Did it happen for you at all? A little bit. Yeah. Not much. <laughs> we joke about one <laughs> there where we went to go arrest a guy and he was kind of older and feeble, but not that old, just probably like late sixties and feeble. And he came to the door cause he wouldn't come. He, we, we, wanted to, we wanted him to come outside, like go yeah. check his mail. And we would just get him. We opened his door and he goes, well, I need to go get some. So he's turning away from us. So your first thought is, He's going for a weapon. So my friend basically took him to the ground and I helped. And then we just kind of just did the like, it was just like we practiced, you know, like two man take down. And then he had his hands and I had his legs. And and we still talk about that because I had my friend's back because it it happened real quick, you know. But that's like the craziest stuff we get, you know, other than when you do a search warrant. Like I've been on search warrants with DEA where it's back when we used to do more high speed entry. And like everyone down on the ground, you just have everyone prone and just mm-hmm. you're just handcuffing. That's pretty crazy too. Yeah, those search warrants are, you know, those can get sketchy. Oh well, I mean, that, my scariest, well, scariest is just you know that initial entry where you're pounding on the door, the dogs barking, people are scared, people aren't complying, people are they're not dressed, so they're like, I gotta go get my clothes, and you're like, show me your hands, and someone's in a room, and they won't open the door, and you have to kick the you're like just. Search warrants is that first five or ten minutes, and then after that, it's boring. Yes, yeah. you're just searching all day. You know, <laughs> it's not Listing like law everything and order. down. Yeah. <laughs> law and order where they're like getting out in five minutes. Like our search warrants could take all day or like twenty four hours. Sometimes yeah, right. The computer forensic stuff. Oh but yeah, yeah, absolutely. It sounds sexy on TV, but um, yeah. nobody talks about the paperwork. Oh no, well that's the thing. And then you get all these <laughs> records. Like if you're the case agent, uh-huh. and we come home with twenty boxes of records. You got to go through that stuff. I mean, that takes months, if not years. Yeah, and you're doing it at a level of you're doing the numbers and all kinds of stuff that you know we you know usually street cops when you know we had a couple financial guys and detectives, right? right. Man, oh, yeah. You know. Push that aside for yeah. Them. Well, it's just it's <laughs> you're like um, next level stuff. There, you become more of an accountant at that point. Yeah, but then you have to go interview people, and so it just takes a long time. But uh, so you've never been yeah. on our podcast before? Nope. No. We recently got connected through your family and yeah. stuff going on here in this area, which is really cool. And I think it'd be important for you to let the listeners know who you are and what you do and what your goal is and the mission of your organization that you're working with right now. And then we'll jump into some some past stuff that you've been involved with, talk about some more of the IRS stuff and focus on on Rose. And then we'll answer some questions we got from social media and we'll have a good time and jump into some things before then. You know, I was telling you, I, I think of stuff while we're talking. I'm like, hey, look, let's let's talk about this now. You know, <laughs> and it happens. So, so yeah, introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers here. My name is Brian Watson, and I'm a community outreach specialist for a nonprofit called ROSE. And ROSE is an acronym. It stands for Resources and Outreach to Safeguard the Elderly. Mm-hmm. And what we primarily do is in-person presentations to senior adults, mostly in Maricopa County, um, at retirement communities, senior facilities, face-to-face, where we can share the latest scams with them with the intent of educating them so it doesn't happen to them in the future. Right. And then we want them to tell their family and their friends and share that. Um, so I got connected with Rose through the founder, Joyce, because she interviewed me on her Zoom mm-hmm. and posted it on the Rose website. And I did two of them, and I, I thought she did a great job interviewing me. It was It was a great way to share information. And... I was in the position to retire, 
and looking to stay in the communications realm because I love warning people about scams. Yeah. It's like my favorite part about being an IRS PIO. And that was my former career. I was a special agent with IRS criminal investigation. So I saw an opportunity to retire, but keep doing the things I love to do, interact with the public, do TV, radio, and stop scammers, trying to put them out of business and mm -hmm. educate people so they're not victims. Because there's nothing worse than talking to someone who's been victimized by a financial crime. Yeah. Because it's, it's horrible. There might not be scars and stitches, but when you lose your life savings and you're depressed about it, it's it's pretty sad. Yeah. You know, we were talking before the show when I was a street cop, we took cases like this once a week at least. It's just nonstop. Yeah. Because the scammers are relentless. Yeah. And everybody has a smartphone mm -hmm. or even a landline at home. And yeah. that is a portal to your financial information and your personal information. Mm -hmm. And just with a simple phone call, someone could wipe you out because right. they're really good at what they do. Mm -hmm. They're following scripts that have been proven to work and they keep tweaking them and they're good. They get you on the phone and once they get you talking, um, they they can make you do some crazy things. They can yeah. make you drive down to the bank and pull out $20,000 and wire it to an account overseas. Yeah. So every time that phone rings, you just have to assume the worst that that person is out to ruin you financially. Right. It's crazy how the cases too that always kind of blew me away was when people would give them remote access to their computers. Mm. Like we had a couple where we got there and yep. they were still accessing the laptop and doing things. So that, that just happened to my friend's mother-in-law here yep. in town. Oh man. Uh, she received a phone call the person on the other line said he was with a company that she has a subscription with and said, we have a refund for you. Mm -hmm. So you think, well, how could this be a scam if someone's offering me money? Here's the catch. He said the only way to return that money to her was to do it via her computer. So he sent her an email or some sort of pop-up on her computer where she had to give remote access. Wow. And then she's at home on her screen. Something pops up and it looks like them trying to return money and she had to type in a number mm -hmm. which was her quote refund and we're talking somewhere around five hundred dollars yeah so not a crazy number but enough to get your attention right their little scheme the way it works is it adds a couple zeros to it so it made it look like she typed in extra money so then the call went from i'm here to help you to you're stealing from us you just took a whole bunch of extra money what are you doing you need to pay us back so, you know, they got her all confused. Um, they're threatening her, saying you need to go buy some gift cards. It eventually ended up where she was down at the bank. Yeah. Pulling out money from multiple accounts and wiring it to an overseas bank account. And she lost it. And this is because of stress inoculation. You think that has a big component of it? It's like just getting them stressed and bent up like, oh, I got to take care of this now. Right. Because the, the common theme on all these schemes is the immediacy. Yeah. They do not give you any time to think about it. Mm -hmm. They don't say, ma'am... You owe us some money. Um, can you scratch us a check and mail it to us in the next three days? There's none of that. Right. They want to be paid immediately mm -hmm. from you know a wire transfer, crypto, uh, gift cards. They want they want to they don't want you to talk to someone else because as soon as you mention that to your son or daughter or neighbor or friend, mm -hmm. they're gonna say no, that's a scam. Yeah, but they do it before you can figure out it's a scam, and then by then the money's gone. Lots of money. You know, we we talk about just that one component. Every, I wouldn't say every day, but probably every other day I get a text message. Hey, your your package is not going to arrive because blah, blah, blah. Yep. From Amazon or UPS, click this link. We're seeing that. That uh, seems to have popped up a lot more for, for me, per se. I don't know how it is out in the world. You might have some more. No, I'm, that, um, I've received that exact text message. Mm -hmm. It's We call those smishing. So it's smishing. Okay. SMS, short message service. That's the technical word for texting. And you get a link saying your package can't be delivered. Click this link to get your package. And it, the reason it works is so many of us order so many things mm -hmm. online from Amazon, from other websites. I'm a big REI guy. I'm always getting stuff from REI. And I actually watched a security expert mm -hmm. who has a, his own website online 
and he he actually videoed him going to that link from a safe computer because even if any computer they could put some malware on your computer if you're not careful right he went on there clicked on the link and it asked for his email address and his mailing address okay no big deal then he went to the next page asked for his credit card number said they were going to charge 30 cents to re-deliver the package well think about it they're not going to just take no. 30 cents they're going to take as much as you can here's the key i went to the usps website mm -hmm. and they have a whole section on these texting uh schemes they will not send you a link unless you re unless you request tracking right so you know whenever you're in doubt just stop pause don't react right away take a break mm -hmm. go to your home computer do some research you know call usps directly or go down to the local post office you know mm -hmm. same with the bank you know don't click on links if you think there's something wrong with your bank, your account's frozen, it can wait. Right. Take that break, call the bank from a verified number, or go down to a local branch. Mm -hmm. We The biggest thing people do to get in trouble is by clicking on links and providing personal information. Right, right. The next one is email. So I almost got caught up in an email one one time because they put together this really, it was from PayPal, right? Really well put together email even had the logo down at the bottom that was really, really, really well put together. But what I noticed is punctuation issues mm -hmm. that aren't normal, capital letters and spots that shouldn't be. And then the other thing that I keyed in on is I went to the email account it came from and I clicked on the arrow down and it read some crazy long, yes. you know what I mean? Some yep. crazy long yep. at gmail.com. And I'm like, yeah, that's probably not, Probably yes. not good, but I I had almost clicked. I'm like, because I use PayPal pretty often at the time. I was doing transactions for you know licensing things and whatnot. I'm like, oh, this might be legit. It looks so good on the surface, but like you said, stop, pause, look in things. And I looked at that, and the thing that set me off the most was that email address. No, and that's very good, and that's why it's important to do it from a home computer with a big screen. Because mm -hmm. if you had your little smartphone with the mini screen, yeah. you wouldn't be, able, wouldn't be able to see it. Yeah. Here's another um, tip I've learned over the years is a lot of times there's a link at the bottom where right. they want you to continue on. Yeah. Don't click on it, but uh -huh. hover your mouse over it, and then it'll show it's also going to a very long, obscure website where it's just trouble. You don't mm -hmm. want to go there as well. Right. You know, those emails, the grammar, that's a good clue. But with, with AI, it's in the chat GPT, like you can run, especially because a lot of these scammers are, are coming, these are coming from other countries. So people, English may not be their first language. So now they can run their little script or their words through something and mm -hmm. it'll clean it up. Yeah. So we're going to see better and better grammar. But you're right, the fonts, mm -hmm. they, they can just they're just doing copy paste from websites. So they can make it look like the IRS, the Postal Service, Bank of America, Amazon, PayPal, you name it. Yeah. So you just have to assume any email you get, you know, you have to ask yourself, could this be a phishing phishing email? And when I say phishing, that's like phishing with the PH, mm -hmm. which we still consider, when I say we, you know, federal law enforcement and now me in the nonprofit world, Phishing is still the number one thing out there. Yeah. Just because, you know, phone calls take a long time. They're very labor intensive to mm -hmm. scam someone. But a scammer with a powerful computer and a lot of email addresses can send out thousands of phishing emails in a single day. Mm -hmm. How much have these scammers taken people for in the last year? So we don't know. You know, um, or reported, I would yeah, say. What's so, been reported? So the stat that we're using with Rose is uh, 82 million documented for the state of Arizona. Just the state of Arizona. Just state of Arizona. 82 million just right. in the state. Oh, yeah, man. And, and you can go to FBI's website and you'll see stats that have been reported nationwide. They track, they can track financial frauds on ic3.gov, mm -hmm. which is their Internet Crime Complaint Center. So ic3.gov. Um, but we know the number of reported crimes is much lower because people one they're embarrassed yeah they they don't want to tell someone that they've been victimized or they may not even realize they've been victimized or maybe they were victimized they've lost a bunch of money but they don't even know who to report it to 
And at that point, they're like, whatever, it's gone. I'm yeah. not going to get this money back. So I'm just going to just move on with my life. Man, $82 million. That's sad. It That's is. just here. It, that just it blows is. me away. That just blows me away. Blows, blows me away. Sorry. So, what was the motivation to start Rose? I know you said that you know you've been doing this, but like, there's probably other people involved that have come together to do this and you know go after the mission. What what motivated the start of it? So, Rose was founded by a lady named Joyce Petrowski mm -hmm. about two years ago. Okay. And she she has an accounting background like me, so that's where she and I connect. You know, we we we, we think numbers and the same thing. She had a close family member defrauded in a financial scam. Yeah. And she started doing research on it and realized there weren't a lot of nonprofits doing the outreach that we're doing right now. Yeah. So she she did it right. She she took her time. She talked to a lot of people. She got a board of directors and an advisory committee. And uh, she's been doing it for, for two years. Uh, we're very lean, meaning, you know, we're, we're small, mostly volunteers yeah. that, that do this. Um, and we want to stop people from being defrauded because you've worked all your life. You've, mm -hmm. you've earned this money. You retire. Those should be the best years of your life. Right. You shouldn't have to worry about your money. You should be like, well, where am I going out to dinner tonight? And, you know, what am I getting my grandchild for, for Christmas? And right. do I have enough money to go on this vacation or can I fund a child's, a grandchild's education? So we, she wanted to stop that. And I was just impressed the thing that really impressed me about Rose is when I did the two video interviews via Zoom and I went to their website to see all the resources there. I was learning things on their website and I was a you know a special agent for IRS investigating scams for 28 years and right. I was learning stuff from their website cuz wow. it's constantly being updated. And so we just want to really focus on the state of Arizona just talk to as many people as possible, whether in person or whether TV, radio, podcasts like we're doing now. Yeah, thanks for or, being uh, Or, uh, you know, newspaper articles. But mm -hmm. we want to protect the people, you know, especially seniors, mm -hmm. because it also, and then it also affects their children and grandchildren. It does, yeah. Because, you know, if, if you have a, a, a senior adult, you know, a parent who's in their, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, and they've lost a bunch of money, there's ramifications for that, you yeah. know, like they might, they may have lost everything or they might be depressed about it or they may have credit issues and things like that. So we're trying to solve a lot of problems on the front end through prevention. Great website too. How do they, what's the URL for it? What's the website link? So it's roseadvocacy.org, roseadvocacy.org. Yeah, I was on it and I was telling you, it's great. It's that's good stuff. There's Those a lot of great statistics. stuff there. Um, we also have um, Facebook. We post a lot of stuff on Facebook. The big thing with our website is uh, right on the front page, there's a, a, a blue box you can click to get added to our mailing list. And we send out an email once a month with the latest scams. So right. you can stay on top of it and it'll show up in your inbox. And then there are also some people who just prefer us mail will actually put you on a, a standard snail mail right list and we'll do that as well mm -hmm. but um the information joyce and other people involved with rose are in contact with a lot of people in the industry for, from a lot of different angles so we're always hearing the newest thing we're kind of you know kind of like a one-stop shop for the latest fraud so we we hear about something and then we share it right on we're going to take that information we're going to post it on our social media as well we'll share some of your start sharing your stuff now that we have you here and know that you're a great resource for protecting people and before the show we got together and we you exchanged some notes and stuff and um you were talking about family and how it could have an impact on their kids and whatnot there's one here that you highlighted where you spoke to a woman in northern arizona who lost three quarter of a mil three quarters of a million dollars including her house in a romance scam can we talk about this? Absolutely. Uh, and I actually, I do a lot of radio up in the Prescott area. Oh, right on. Or Flagstaff, just some great radio stations up there. And after I did one of my show appearances, I got a call from somebody who contacted the station because her friend had lost about 700000 in a romance scam. So for a romance scam, what is it for yeah. people who are not familiar with it? It's an online scam, typically starts through social media or you know a dating site something mm -hmm. like that the scammers will target someone who 
is a widow or a widower. Okay. Someone who used to having a relationship, someone married their whole life Mm -hmm. and they're lonely. And someone says, well, why don't you get on this site and, you know, make a friend or, you know, maybe you'll find a boyfriend or girlfriend. Well, there's the criminals are out there lurking and they start small. They'll just introduce and say hi. And then, then it becomes more amorous over time. And it's the long play. Mm -hmm. This is not a quick scam. This is one that takes a long time. Okay. So she met someone online at a certain point, they're referring to each other as boyfriend, girlfriend. He bas- Here's the, um, the scam. He says, you, wanna, you have a bunch of money. You want to invest it so your grandchildren will be set up for the future and your kids. You know about Bitcoin, right? It's the wave of the future. So the, the scammer had her actually going down to a local store, depositing cash into a Bitcoin ATM. Mm-hmm like a lot of money and he provided the little the qr code which is the the key the private key there's Mm -hmm. the private key and the public key if if you're familiar with investing with the cryptocurrencies she was putting all this money in but she didn't have control over it so the there's this the term called pig butchering okay it's something that came out of china um it's uh, pig butchering there's there's a chinese word that it came from that i cannot pronounce because i'll i'll butcher that word (laughs) um and what they do is you're basically you're fattening up the person for the kill you have them invest all this money until it's gone in this case this lady lost i mean we're talking seven hundred thousand dollars wow and then at a certain point he just went in for the kill took the money transferred it she had no access to it anymore out of her house, renting a room, very embarrassed. But she talked to me about it. She explained the whole thing. I I ended up having her contact the FBI. Um, they actually had an open case on these people. And that's mm. why it's important to report these things. Right. Because the scammer that got her, it wasn't a one-shot deal. Yeah. That scammer was going after many different people. So we want to combine those cases mm-hmm. for the investigation, for the prosecution, for the trial. But this lady, I felt horrible for her. Yeah, she, she said, you know, her husband would be rolling over in his grave if if he knew her her deceased husband, Sad. if he knew that their all that work they did in their life was just taken. I mean, and that's an extreme example. Yeah, you know these 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 romance scammers, and if they figure out you don't have money, they'll use you as what we call a money mule, mm-hmm. meaning. They'll just have you move money for them. And the reason why they do that is they want to add layers of protection. So when law enforcement tries to follow the money, yeah, there's someone in between. There's there's multiple people. They're just moving money in and out of the country amongst different people. Yeah. So if, if you're moving money for your boyfriend, that's a clue of a romance scam. If you're depositing cash into a Bitcoin ATM, yeah. you know, that's probably a, a scam. If you're if you're buying prepaid gift cards. That's a scam as well, but yeah. it's these. That's an extreme example, but but it's real. It, but it's but it's real, and it's close, close to close to home. Is in northern Arizona, and yeah. I'm sure there's similar cases down here in southern Arizona as well. Yeah, and uh, throughout the U.S., you know, that's Absolutely. the great thing this podcast goes. We have listeners in West Virginia, California, you know, all over the place. That's a sophisticated enterprise. It is, and. With that sophistication, these cases probably have to take some time, right? Like, what what is the average time these take to work through? If I, if there is an average, I mean, I'm sure there's a big gap, but what would you say would be like the median amount of time for this? Yeah, months, if not years. I mean, it depends on how many bank accounts you have to get, and yeah. then it makes it more difficult because bank accounts are overseas, and then you're in you're dealing with cryptocurrency, and that goes both ways. You can, with the blockchain, you can trace transactions, but there's also a lot of anonymity. You know, I'm, as a former federal investigator, yeah. um, I was very jaded towards cryptocurrency just because I knew all the criminals used it because mm-hmm. of the anonymity. Yeah. Obviously, there's nothing illegal about it. It's only illegal if you're dealing with illegal activities like right. drugs or stolen identities or things you know schemes and things like that um but it just it just takes time because then you issue a, a subpoena a grand jury subpoena for some records you get the bank records it takes time to get those records it's right. not like tv where they get them the next day it can take weeks yeah or months to get bank records then you analyze those accounts then you find new accounts so then you have to get new subpoenas so it just 
it just it's a multi-step process. It mm-hmm. takes time. You know, for a a tax case, a federal you know tax evasion case, a lot I worked you know, my agency IRS criminal investigation. Seventy percent of what we de- did was, is tax related. I had a case that took seven years. Wow. From the time we first got an informant to talk to us to the time the person was sentenced. Part of that's the legal system. Once you get into the legal system, things can slow down. Um, and But it's just a reality. Um, right. In the meantime, you work on another case. But for instance, on like one of these um, romance scams, you know, it, you know, it, it could take a long time to, you know, finally get justice if you actually could find the person. Right. Thanks for that insight. You know, what do nearly what do all the scams have in common? What's the common thing here? So they what they do is it's kind of like three things. You're so you're always contacted first, right? So phone, email, s- social media, and then there's something important like your child, your grandchild's in jail, or here's an investment opportunity, or your bank account is closed because of suspicious activity. So then there's the thing where you have to act. And then the third stage is always a call for money. They okay. they want you to pay. Okay. Either to, you know, pay off pay off, you know, get your kid out of jail, get that grandchild out of jail, or to pay off a debt or to invest in some sort of scheme. So th- every single one of them, no matter what scheme I talk about, has those three things. And then the overarching thing we see with it is urgency. No right. time to think. We mentioned that at the beginning mm-hmm. where they want you to act now. They don't want you to talk to someone else. They'll actually tell you to put your phone on do not disturb because they don't even want someone That's interesting. to tap in. Yeah, yeah. They don't want someone to call in and, and you know, the call waiting pops up and Interrupt it. all of a sudden, let's say you took the call and say, oh yeah, I'm talking to some gentleman and he says my bank account's frozen and I need to go down to Walmart and buy some prepaid gift cards. Well, the person on the other end of the line would say, oh, that's a scam. Yeah. So that's why they'll tell you to do not disturb. No or, kidding. Or, 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 you know, they don't, they want you to act immediately. Wow. So how do you guys measure success over at Rose? That's, that's a question I asked uh, when, when I was, looking to uh, join the team is um, it's it's hard to prove a negative. Right. So how do you prove that you've stopped crime? You you just can't. You know, yeah. we mentioned that 82 million in Arizona. You know, if, if that number starts dropping in the future, we can say, well, we had a small part in that, but it, it, it it's hard to prove. Um, so I asked Joyce, our CEO and founder, how we measure success. You know, a lot of it's anecdotal. Mm-hmm. A lot of it is we do a presentation at a senior community and we tell them about the latest scams. And then when we come back in six months to refresh and remind, right. um, Joyce was telling me people will come up to her and say, you know what? I, I received this call and I've received that call and I got that email. And from what you told me, I knew it was a scam. So I hung up on them or I deleted that email. So that's, that's success right there. Yeah. You know, and it just, we just, you just know the more people you talk to, the more people that go to our website, the more people that are on our mailing list, it, it has to have a thing, but it, it is very difficult to put a, a, a number on it. And, and, and I want a number because I have an accounting background. Yeah. You know, I, I'd love <laughs> to see, I want the numbers always prove it, but right. it, it, it's going to be tough, but, yeah. we, but we'll see where, where we are in a few years. Yeah. I can tell you personally, just hearing what you guys are doing, that's that's a huge impact. Um, you know, just at the local police department, I know that every once in a while they'd go to like the sunflower areas here and and, and kind of cover this kind of stuff, but likely not as in depth as you guys are, which is really great. Are there any public forums or anything coming up that people can go to uh, to to get a little bit more information in person per se if they're if they're interested? Um, I would not. Immediately, most of what I've been doing, so I've been on for about a month, is mostly been doing radio interviews. Um, I've been working, you know, reaching out to people I know in the law enforcement community, Mm -hmm. trying to set up some presentations with um, Oro Valley, Marana, Mm -hmm. Tucson, um, Pima County Sheriff. Um, I'd like to do things where the public's invited. Right on. You know, I've done that in the past when I was a special agent with the IRS, Mm -hmm. and you get a lot of people show up. And then what we do is we encourage them to tell others, you know, or also we tell them, you know, if you've received one of these calls, mm-hmm. don't just keep it a secret. Yeah. Go on Facebook and say, someone just called me and said my grandchild was in jail. 
you know, or someone just called me and said my Norton antivirus, you know, yeah. it, there's a refund coming. They wanted access to my mm -hmm. um, screen so they could refund the money. Tell people about that. Right. You know, that's that's how we it's awareness. Mm -hmm. That's how we, we stop these criminals. And you want to empower the younger generation, too, because they're more savvy. Right. Like my generation, like we know how to use all the stuff. I grew up in the social media boom. I've been around for every single platform that came to be, and I've been on almost every single pl right. platform. And we know a lot of back end stuff here too, as well. And it would be, it would be a crime, in my opinion, if I did not incur or like, educate my my elders in my family, right? right? And I, I actually do spend a lot of time trying to like, hey, don't fall for this. This is shady. Don't do this, you know. And we've had victims in my family. My my mom's mom. It was like last year. She had gotten hacked and, and had given money. You know, I'm getting a phone call. Mm. Hey, uh, you know, I got my stuff. So if you get anything from me, like a message or something, they took over her whole smart device, her whole phone, and started shooting out text messages. And the <laughs> well, that's why <laughs> telling people like, hey, you need to send money. I'm in trouble. So the, what I've been telling everyone is you got to have these conversations ahead of time. Right. Not after the fact, after someone's lost their money, but yeah. So I have chats with my, my parents. I chat my, my mom, she's received these scam calls or scam mm -hmm. emails. So we talk about them. Yeah. But, I, but tell everyone, you need to have a plan. You know, mm -hmm. what do you do if someone's on the phone and all of a sudden you realize they're asking you for personal information or your financial information, you got to have a, an escape plan, yeah. you know, hang up, yeah. click. Or if you're, you know, that, I think a lot of, you know, we'll, we, we pick on seniors, you know, because, but the reason why the scammers go after the seniors is typically they have more money than right. most people because they've accumulated wealth over life. Not, mm -hmm. I mean, not every senior has money. Some of them are on a fixed income and are barely getting by, but there's a lot of seniors who have a lot of money. Seniors come from a generation that is much more trusting. Mm -hmm. So I would say I'm in my early fifties, my right. age and older, we're used to answering the phone. Yeah. Because- didn't have an answer machine or call waiting when when I was a kid, and we're used to being polite, and that gets even more so as, as the older you get. Um, so, and then the criminals I know from experience. When I was a special agent, there was a Jamaican lottery scam that my coworker investigated. The lead lists that they called, the list of people who they called over the phone, they only wanted people who were eighty plus. No kidding. Because they knew they would get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of someone would be more likely to have cognitive decline mm -hmm. or, or Alzheimer's or some other memory loss. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of 80 or 90-year-olds that are sharper than both of us. Right. But they just know percentage-wise that's what they want to do. But you know what, too? Young people fall for these scams as well. I told well, you. I almost did. But, so. but here's the deal. A lot of young people don't have money yet. Right. You know, if you're a teenager, your early 20s, you know, y you may only have a few hundred dollars in your bank account. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why they're going after the seniors, because they've had a lifetime to accumulate wealth. And the mm -hmm. thing is, with young people, they tend to be very trusting of their devices. Mm -hmm. They think if something came in via text or email that it's legit. Yeah. But I've seen young people get scammed in Craigslist scams where people sell stuff online and it's fake and things like that. Yeah. Facebook's like that a lot, too. I use Facebook Marketplace. I sold a car on there a couple weeks ago, and uh, they're doing better. I mean, they're, they're starting to send notifications. If somebody writes you a message, it'll say, hey, this account has only been here for like a couple months. Right. Use some use some caution. It's a new account, which is kind of cool because a lot of the scammers and stuff we see on social media were pretty new accounts. And for us, so we run a – this is an interesting one. I don't know how in-depth this goes. I don't know if you guys have investigated anything regarding this, but we own some groups that have several thousand members. And for whatever reason, these weird, and we'll, we track back. We're looking at their um, their emails involved. They're looking at their profile information mm -hmm. and stuff. They'll take over somebody's account or they'll make this fake account that looks like somebody that's from the area or from the United States. And they go into these groups and they try to sell air duct cleaning services. Is it real or completely fake? It's fake. Okay. So we haven't, so we work really hard to make sure that there's no victims inside of, we don't even allow those posts to go through because we're familiar with all of the companies in the area yeah. that actually do it. Right. And the phone numbers they'll try po posting the ad with are not, the area codes are not from here. Right. But right. this is a daily occurrence. Well, how often would you say, Clint, 
daily. Yeah, this is a daily occurrence wow. in our groups that we're managing. So we we actually even show people who are members in our groups. Every once in a while, we'll post a transparency post and we'll show how many uh, attempted membership requests got declined. And it's usually more get declined than get accepted into the group because what we're seeing is it'll be a new profile on Facebook. We'll go to their, we'll visit their profile. We'll hit the, they'll have a profile picture they recently posted. Okay. <laughs> and we'll click and see who liked it and who loved it and comments and everything. And a lot of times there'll be accounts that are overseas. Yeah. Well, they're trying to get into your group because they know there's a lot of potential victims there. Right. And the bigger the group, the bigger the target. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I'm, not, I'm not surprised at all. And it's just so strange that it's air duct cleaning. Yeah. <laughs> like every, every do, single time. Do they even spell it right? <laughs> they do. Okay. And I think they're using, you know, of course, they're using AI and stuff like that to build these. But the photos they use, too, are always just not from the area, right? And they're posting like... Do you ever reverse... You ever do the search on the photo to see if where it came from? Because a lot of times with the romance scams, yeah, they will post a picture of somebody that they just took, took off, off the, the internet yeah, screenshot and it. Uh, and you can you can figure out where it came from. Yeah, a lot of times we haven't. And that's another step for us. We haven't put in a lot of time to go that far, but um, the pictures are always pictures that look like somewhere from the Midwest, right? There's, <laughs> there's green trees all over the background. The house builds are not your standard stucco builds here. They're not from Arizona. <laughs> no. I hear you. No, and it's just been this interesting phenomenon that's happened in our groups that we, we talk about all the time. And we've actually seen it. Clint's a member of the Facebook. What is it called? So Facebook developed a power group uh, through Meta that they invited certain group admins to be in and this conversation has come up a lot with the the air duct cleaning <laughs> and they're wow. always like what is going on with this thing so it's something we've seen in the last year that's like really had a big uptick that we constantly have to go and 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 not allow every once in a while somebody will get through and will attempt to post it we never that's where they hit the dead end because we always look at the post and go, oh, great, another error. Because as the administrator, you have the ultimate authority to keep people out. Yeah. And that's good because if you're a, a company, a business, a group, mm -hmm. or anything like that, you have a responsibility to protect your people. Yeah. You know, protect their information. Right. And what we saw too is, I won't drop names, but <laughs> local government organizations had uh, created groups as well. And we saw a lot of those posts getting put into the groups. And they made it through? Yeah, oh yeah. So they're not as on top of it as yeah, you guys Yeah, they've are. really improved. Like, I don't think we see it much anymore, but at first we were like, we someone from here reached out and was like, <laughs> hey, you might want to <laughs> watch these because these are just odd. I don't think air duct cleaning is that big of an issue where we need no. to be. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, sorry, I went down a rabbit hole on that, but I just wanted to share that no, one I, with you in case so somebody I, comes I across love, that. Um, so what I've found is just doing the radio shows and meeting different people at this at this new gig. I'm always learning about the new scams. Yeah. And I always want to stay on top of what's out there. Yeah. So if you come across this and you get some insight about it, reach out to us and let us know I will, I'm what giving, you're finding. I'm like saying, if you guys get yeah. get somebody, that, I don't know if you guys do investigative stuff on your own where you kind of toy with these people. Because at the PD when I worked there, if one of us got a call or we were, you know, we, 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 we played them for a good hour and a half. We, so. we would do that with the <laughs> IRS phone scam yeah. where literally I, there was one day I'm, at the IRS with my special agent coworker, <laughs> and he received the IRS phone scam call. No, oh, yeah, let's and go. And the guy's saying, we're from the IRS. And they go, oh, really? And we just tried to see how long we could keep him on the line. <laughs> and the guy stayed on the line, and finally he just gave up. But yeah. we were toying with them. I don't necessarily recommend that to people. Just if, it, if you recognize the scam, just hang up. But yeah. if you're bored and you feel like you're not going to be scammed in any way, you could toy with them a little bit. Well, there's a guy on uh, YouTube. You know who I'm going to talk. I, I forgot his name, but he goes and he <laughs> he corrects their behavior live and records it. <laughs> he goes and takes money from them. Really? <laughs> he'll like Amazing. mess. He'll he'll access their computers and move stuff around. And wow. Say, yeah. So it's almost uh, like a, a little reversal. Yeah. That he just attacks scammers. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know what I'm. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Yeah, like, I see it. I'm like, good for you, man. As long as he's not doing anything illegal. No, I don't you think you know. He and is, and yeah. I'm not with the federal government anymore. Yeah. I'm I'm in the. I'm yeah. just a, a private citizen. Yeah, now. I ain't trying to give you a new case <laughs> here, brother. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's talk about your career. 
I think that that's uh, I've never had the honor to interview an IRS agent, and I've also had the blessing to not have to deal with an IRS agent. So I'm not going so some wood here. But uh, is there any particular case that you think would be cool to share with us, or, or, or you don't have to give us the correct name, but kind of just give us what happened, you know, walk us through it, what kind of business or what what was involved? Because I know that you said that you dealt with tax evasion. I can't talk about tax evasion, filing false tax returns, refund schemes, investment schemes, Ponzi schemes. We all, we've heard of a ton of those, yep, right? But yep. like, what's something different that maybe somebody hasn't heard of that you could share with us? Um, well, that you worked. Yeah, I mean, so I when you, I was an IRS special agent for 28 years, um, everything we did were financial cases, right? And that had that had to be the connection. Seventy percent was tax. The other thirty percent could be narcotics mm-hmm. or other financial crimes. And um, you know, the, the common theme in all of them is they took a long time. Um, the one that w- was it, I think, was one of the most interesting was the the Balco steroid investigation I'm, out of the Bay Area. I'm glad you put yeah. this in here. I just watched the documentary on ESPN Plus just, not too long ago, long yeah. ago about this. So that case was actually worked by an IRS special agent in San Jose, California. Okay, a friend of mine and colleague named Jeff Novitsky. And I'm actually reading the book Game of Shadows right now. Uh-huh. Um, but it was this guy named Victor Conti. Yeah who actually was in the group Tower of Power at one time. He's a <laughs> bassist. But basically, they were selling um, it was steroids to professional athletes. Um, I helped out just a little bit on the case. Just Olympians, because right, too. Olympian, Marion yeah. Jones, Tim Montgomery. Um, there's cyclists. Um, then, it, then it morphed into baseball. And mm-hmm. a lot of the changes we're seeing in baseball are a direct result of this investigation. It was um, so... My work on it was just a little bit because when you uh, have a case like that, Jeff enlisted everybody in the office to help for the search warrants. Right. But I actually got to go out on the search warrant. I was at Victor Conti's house. <laughs> I ended up being um, the affiant on the search warrant for this guy. Um, it was actually Bonds's trainer, but we did the we we searched the house. We found all kinds of indicia of, uh, of of steroid use. But that was a crazy case. You know that it got worldwide. Um, attention mm-hmm. and it, it it really changed um, how people looked at performance enhancing drugs in baseball mm-hmm. and in other sports and I thought it, it it was very impactful and a lot of people said well why was an IRS special agent investigating it well because we could investigate it from the financial side right because all this money had to go through bank accounts mm-hmm. and it was illegal. Um, but that, you know, that, that was a cool case. Um, the case I like to talk about was one of mine that I worked back in the Bay area and the guy was a a telemarketer, commercial fundraiser. Okay. So he would find a charity that needed to raise money. Mm -hmm. So that charity would hire him or his people to, to raise money and they had a contract and they would get 75 to 90% of the money off the top, which... I was like, wow. And, and, and the case- that was on the contract? Yes. So here's the deal. Um, so that's why when, when, I, when people donate over the phone or the internet, yeah, I tell them, make sure you're not paying the middleman. Right. If you want to donate to a charity, go find that charity on your own and go directly to their website and, and donate. Well, back yeah. then, this was pre-website days. Everything was done over the phone. Well, there was a local detective from one of the sheriff's departments, saw those contracts and knew it just wasn't right. Yeah. But he had a contract. It was legal. So they referred it over to the U.S. Attorney's Office. U.S. Attorney's Office invited our agency, IRS Criminal Investigation, to investigate. We start investigating. And uh, one day we did a, a surveillance, like on a Saturday, when all the telemarketers would drive into the main office and drop off their checks that they've accumulated over the week. They'd made phone calls. People agreed to donate to a certain charity. They'd drive out, pick up the checks, and then on Saturday they'd bring them all in. Well, my subject, the guy that we're investigating, got in his car with a, a box. He put a box in the trunk. And we're like, where's this guy going? Is he too cheap to have trash service? And he drove a couple miles to an abandoned building, pulled in the back, got out, threw the whole box into the dumpster. Oh, all that's right, not right. weird. We're like, what's going on? <laughs> so we drove off. He went back to the office. Someone went into the dumpster. Luckily, it was empty because the building was vacant. Grabbed a bunch of bank records and letters and things like that. Monday morning, I'm in the office looking at this stuff. And Mm -hmm. 
all these different names, names I didn't recognize, but they all had the same address. They all had the same private mailbox, like a mailboxes, et cetera. Now okay. think UPS store, something like that. So we issued subpoenas, grand jury subpoenas for all those bank records. They, we realized very quickly it was all my guy that I was investigating. He was nice. not happy with his 75 to 90% cut. Okay. He was not even turning over all the checks. So he may have been taking 95 to 98% when it was all said and done. Wow. But we were really the only agency that could prosecute that because we got him for filing either tax evasion or filing false tax returns. Mm -hmm. Husband and wife both went to prison. Wow. And, you know, they were living a very lavish lifestyle. And they were doing it by just stealing from charities. And, um, you know, now if he had just reported all the money and been honest with what he turned over for to the uh, the charities, he would have been fine. That's crazy. But he was yeah. greedy. And then that's the thing, too. With, with all these financial cases, it's just greed. Greed is probably 90% of the cases that I yeah. worked. Yeah. People, you know, are not happy with what they have. They right. always want more. Yeah. And you know, and it's I think it's probably gotten worse with social media because we like to compare each other, you know, the trips we're taking, That's the a slippery slope, man. <laughs> you know, the, the cars you buy, oh, you man. know, and things like that. It's so <sighs> you, you know, the best advice is just be content with what you have and and you don't need that second vacation home and you don't need that brand new car. <laughs> cause because you know, like you know, I have nothing, you know, nothing wrong with people who are successful and rich. Yeah. But you got to do it. You got to report all your money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're going to get attention. Yes. <laughs> I was just talking to one of the business partners here and we're like, you know, even when you're killing it and you're just, you're just doing really well. You know, I was telling her, I was like, I'm still going to have to get told to go buy clothes by my wife. Because <laughs> she's the only time I'll go get clothes is if. My wife's like, "Hey, Dave, you got a hole on your on your on your butt on your jeans. Like, you should probably you should probably go and do that. You know what I mean?" And and I'm like, "You don't drawing attention in that way. Not only is the tax man gonna go, what's going on there, bud? Or yeah. you know, but people around you are going to too. And yeah. that's a good way to say, "Hey, you want to come get stuff and steal it from me? Show up, right? And even scammers, if I'm yeah." I'm just, you know, we make funny jokes around. We would never go this route, but I'm like, you know, with all the knowledge and the systems we have here at this company, if for whatever reason a bad actor got in here and wanted to do malicious stuff with all the stuff we have, they could put together really, really good phishing stuff. Really, you know, you could because the yeah. technology, AI, Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, you would go on and on yep, and on, yep. right? You could do that. It would... Anyways, I don't know where I was going with that, but you don't want to go down that road. What's that? We have a soul, right? Yeah. Um, well, that's what we talked about earlier. Is a, uh, you know, you 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 sleep better at night. Yeah. If, if you file your taxes accurately and yeah, and, and 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 not cheating someone else. Right. I've actually seen that where I interact with defendants before they've pleaded guilty and after. You know, I can think of a couple defendants where. The first day I met them, they were basically going to admit guilt. They mm -hmm. came in with a defense attorney to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they were just a mess because they were they made some bad choices, done some criminal activity, ripped people off, but they were it was weighing on their conscience. Okay. Conscience, and after they pleaded guilty, man, they looked just that stress you know, just is, is gone and they look so much better because now they have, their soul is clean, you know, yeah. like, like they've admitted their guilt. They're going to, they end up having to go to prison, but <laughs> that's good. But yeah. you know, they look good. And, you know, I actually, one of the old timers in my office, I used, used to work in San Jose. They said this one guy was committing all kinds of crime, financial crimes. He was, uh, he was overweight, heavy drinker, heavy smoker. He stressed out. He looked terrible. The guy came back after his prison sentence to pick up some records. He'd lost weight. He was tan. He'd stopped smoking and drinking, and he looked like a new person. Wow. So it actually showed, like, there is something called rehabilitation and, right. you know, deterrence. Not every criminal goes back in, but that person actually getting caught. Yeah. Changing their life, you know, and not committing crimes anymore was actually very healthy for them. It is, hey, sometimes you just need to change, right? One of those one, the ones that make you uncomfortable, yes. and, and and yeah, it's uh, yeah. And I I apologize for earlier with my little rant. I don't even know where I was going with the uh, <laughs> what we, but but I think it did 
coincide with what you're saying. Like, you just don't want that guilty conscience. Like, and you don't want to give people the opportunity to do to victimize others. And it's just like the tax thing too. Like I was telling you about our taxes. Like my wife's like, Dave, you want to run a business? You need to learn how to do your taxes. She's like, you don't have a clue, but I'm going to help walk you through this. So you understand, so you can know when it's being done right and when it's being done wrong. Right. And you have your conscious working on it because part of me goes, my wife was probably testing my integrity in that, in that moment too. Like, Hey, what kind of businessman you going to be? Right. <laughs> Cause I saw a thing not too long ago. I think it was Joe Rogan was talking about why a lot of, uh, Affluent people will go pay, play golf with somebody they're getting ready to get in business with because they can watch and have people watch to see if that person moves the ball, if oh. they're if they're cheating in any way, if they're lying on the scorecard. Like they can see. They, they can see what kind of integrity they have. Right. Because if you'll cheat at the small things, exactly. you're going to cheat on the big things. Right. I like to go out to lunch with someone or dinner to a restaurant. You know, how does that person treat the, treat staff. the staff? Yeah, right. You I'm know, the same way. Um, because if you treat someone, you know, it shows a lot about your character, right? How, how you talk to someone at a store, how you treat someone younger than you at yeah. a lower position. That says a lot about someone's character as well. Character weighs more than any title, hands down. I don't care what 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 titles in front of your name. If we go somewhere and you're like, just not nah. Title, yeah. <laughs> Title titles don't impress me. Yeah, yeah. Likewise, you have something on here that's very interesting. That I know we're almost at an hour. I think right. Yeah, we're getting close, but. Anyways, uh, Al Capone says, let's talk history of the agency. Let's talk about how you guys took down Al Capone. So, yeah, everyone. It's a big case. You know, it's, it's great. Whenever I do a, a rotary speech or a class presentation at, at the University of Arizona or even at a middle school career fair, I'll say, what did Al Capone go to jail for? And everyone knows it's tax evasion. Mm -hmm. He literally is our poster boy. <laughs> we have a um, <laughs> one year. My mom actually gave me a present, and it was this poster with Al Capone. It says only an accountant could catch Al Capone. And my mom found it at a garage sale, wrapped That's it up, cool. and gave it to me at Christmas. And then dumb Brian, I, I saw it and I was like, well, mom, we have these all over the office. Look in the bottom right corner. It's it's one of our recruiting posters. And then as soon as I said that, I was just like, oh, you were, that was such a bad move. I should have said, mom, that's the greatest gift you could ever <laughs> give an IRS special agent. But he's our poster boy because it was actually the predecessors of my agency. Mm -hmm. um, it was called the Bureau of Revenue back then. It was a guy, and you know, a lot of people think it was Elliot Ness who took down Al Capone, but Elliot Ness was like the ATF angle. That was the guns, mm -hmm. the the bootlegging, the the more serious crimes. I mean, right. Al Capone was doing more serious stuff than just tax evasion. Tax evasion's a felony, and there's ramifications for it, but you're not killing someone, you're not murdering and things like that, but it was these um, IRS guys from the Bureau of Revenue that took down Al Capone, and it was a guy named Elmer Irie and a guy named Frank Wilson. And a lot of this stuff's online mm -hmm. on irs.gov. You can find it on our Freedom of Information page. Um, but Elliot Ness got all this credit in in all the movies and stuff, but it, he, he didn't have anything to do with it. It was these guys that used to be postal inspectors, came over to the IRS and took down Al Capone, um, and they did on the financial side. Yeah. And then, you know, we're in the deterrence business. That's why IRS does what I used to do is – when someone gets convicted, mm -hmm. then it changes behavior. So they said in Chicago, after Capone's conviction, you had all these other gangsters going to the IRS and saying, yeah, I want to get straight here. I want to pay off and get caught up. So I'm not next. <laughs> but literally, Al, Al's our guy, and uh, we talk about him all the time. You know, And the IRS actually has like some of his stuff from back in the day. We have like these guns from Al Capone and wow. some, some stuff. But if you're a history buff... You can go to irs.gov. There's a reading page, Freedom of Information Act, and there's all kinds of historical documents, including the original special agent report when someone was recommending prosecution against Al Capone. And wow. it's it's very dated because this is from, you know, we're talking almost, uh, almost you know, like 90 years ago. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. One thing that also stood out, too, was the conviction rate that the IRS has. 90%. And it's always held that way. And that's because documents, they don't lie. Yeah. Documents, they don't have an opinion. They just, mm -hmm. they're there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, eyewitness testimony is very unreliable. Right. Because things happen quick, under mm -hmm. stress, and you may not remember everything. 
but when we have a you know bank records, I mentioned earlier, I was talking about the commercial fundraiser who was skimming from the skimming checks from the charities. Mm-hmm. There were about thirty bank accounts. Wow. So when you present all those bank accounts to the defendant and list out the money, and it's a very detailed report. Our, our cases take a long time because IRS criminal investigation, special agents are the most cerebral federal agents. <laughs> um, the defense attorney is going to say, yeah, they kind of have us here. Plea out. Let's take a plea because the plea, plea is beneficial for both sides. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason why the defense would take it is you would get reduction for acceptance or responsibility. And then also, too, a lot of times you do that, the judge will sentence you on the low end of the sentencing guidelines. Mm -hmm. The government has these sentencing guidelines that has ranges for every different crime and depending on the loss amount. And it's they're they're done to keep things kind of um, equal across the country. So you don't see big discrepancies from different judicial districts. And a lot of times taking a guilty plea, you could actually avoid prison as well. Um, but that's one of the reasons we have the 90% conviction rate. I went to trial three times. It's three and oh. Wow. I didn't I didn't want to lose ever. Hold on. Yeah. In your 28 years, you went to trial three times. That's it. <sighs> that's really not that much. I've had I know people have gone their whole career and never went to trial. No kidding. Um, but then um one of my coworkers, um, in her first 10 years, she went to trial five times and was <laughs> five and oh. <laughs> so I was telling people, like, you know, you need to put that on your business card. Like yeah. Don't try me. Like I'm very good at what I do. I'm very detail oriented. Yeah. Choose our cases carefully, but this, that's the thing too. Our cases go through a lot of different reviews. Mm-hmm. So by the time it's recommended for prosecution, a lot of people have looked at it. I've right. actually had cases declined by the internal process. I've been very frustrated about it. Yeah, I've been just there, because yeah. they have a high standard. Um, Biggest frustration in my career is just cases I, I couldn't investigate or that were declined before we got to trial. <laughs> so that's how we get that 90% conviction rate. Wow. Yeah. Dang. Three times. I think I did three times in a month back when I was oh. Oh. <laughs> at least maybe in a week sometimes, depending. You yeah. know, we got traffic stuff and all that as well. So those yeah. are those are kind of quick hits. Yeah. So a lot of these were big They're ordeals. Yeah. They're very lengthy with just a tremendous amount of discovery. When I say discovery, that's just evidence. Yeah. Um, government, when someone's indicted, we have to provide all the evidence that we have to the defense. And because at that point, you know, they have the right to defend themselves. So they mm. need to, you know, be able to um, interview the people that have accused them, cross-examination, look at the documents, file yeah. motions and things like that. But once it gets in the legal system, it really slows down. Yeah. So why does an IRS agent need a gun? Because it's we're investigating criminal activity, and some of the people are um, they do some bad things, you know. Mm-hmm. Now the gun is not the most important thing. The most important thing is is the brain and and the computer and making good decisions and interacting with people. But as an IRS special agent, we conducted search warrants. We conducted arrests. Um, surveillances. We're in some bad neighborhoods in some things, you know, um, some crazy stories I heard over the years. Nothing crazy with me, but I mean, I know some agents up in the Phoenix area um, went to go just do a, conduct a random, just a routine interview, and they were greeted at the door with a shotgun, you know? The guy had the draw on them, and obviously they weren't, when someone's got the draw on you, you don't, you don't shoot back. You just, they put their hands up and backed away. But we've had, you know, agents who have been shot at going on certain properties or things like that. Um, but it's it's a very it's a very small, you know, when you go on the search warrant, depending on the situation, you know, sometimes the guns are out, sometimes they're holstered. But you just train for the worst case situation. Right. Um, but the the vast the most important part of the job was is is uh, is between the ears. You mm-hmm. know, it's and it's um, in interviewing is probably the biggest thing. Right. Um, I. I was fortunate to interview people from all walks of life in all kinds of different places. People I never would have met. Yeah. Just because of, um, but because of the job, I got to go interview them, and and then ninety five percent of the time, people were happy to see me. Yeah. Which was higher than I thought when I first started. <laughs> but um, because most of the time you treat people with respect. Right. And right. I treat people the way I would want to be treated, or a family member. I want them to be treated and you treat people with respect, build that rapport, be honest, 
you know, the 5% are people who are either under investigation or work for that person or a family member Mm -hmm. or, you know, but, um, but it, if you're a special agent with IRS and my former agency is the sixth largest federal agency, like, uh, very cerebral, as I mentioned, and we also, our kids take a long time and we have the highest percentage of female special agents of any federal agency. Yeah. We're at 25%. And that number just keeps growing every year. Because I look at our academy photos that come out when I was still with them, you know, and it's a lot of the classes are 40, 50% women because the nature of the job, it's it, brawn is mm-hmm. not the most important thing. Right. Like yeah. you might be with other departments. Um, it's, it's, it's being able to process all that information and work a very coherent criminal investigation, interview a lot of people, and then document it and write a great report. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's really cool. To you guys are, that that agency is doing that, and other agencies are learning from it. That's really cool. So I had uh, gone on social media, and I had posted a video, in kind of like encouraging people to ask questions uh, for this podcast for you. So um, I'm gonna pull these up here. Thanks again for taking the time to to come here today and give us the opportunity to oh my pleasure you. it's been great man i i i love i love to talk about this stuff <laughs> <laughs> me too man it's awesome it's, i love hearing justice i really do yep. it's just great yeah that's it gets me fired up it takes a long time our cases we didn't get that quick hit that you would get yeah. at other agencies you have to be very patient and long suffering yeah but when you finally get to that sentence and justice is served it's it's a great feeling because yeah. you know you did the work you did it right and then um person's gonna you know face the consequences and then also the experience you get from it right like seeing how every case turns and goes this way and you learn these new ways of their how they're moving money here and all this new knowledge that you get from the cases i'm sure is just insane it is so the first one's from instagram account called nightclaw um i think his first name is jd uh, it says, what is the most common and stupidest thing you saw sm- small <laughs> <I can't laughs> that you saw small business owners do with their taxes? So I would say commingling business and personal. Yeah. If you're a biz- if you own a business, keep two separate bank accounts, one for the business and keep your personal separate. Don't right. Don't have them intertwined because then you're tempted um, to 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 write it off. Yeah. You know, and when someone says write it off, that means take it as a business expense. Yeah. Well, if it's a legitimate expense, take it. You're entitled mm-hmm. to it. Yeah. Keep good records, have receipts. So if you're ever audited, you can verify that that was a legitimate business expense. When I was an IRS special agent, I investigated two businessmen and we got successful tax prosecutions and we did it not on the income side, but we did it on the expense side because <laughs> we could look and it's very labor intensive because yeah. some of those are smaller numbers mm-hmm. and it takes a long time. A lot of interviews, a lot of documents, but we were able to show that they were running personal expenses through the business, and then actually those expenses made it to the tax return, meaning they were expenses, business expenses. That's a big no-no. Right. So to that, to answer that question, just don't be tempted. Keep things separate. You will sleep better at night when you right. know you have an honest tax return filed. <laughs> we were talking about the show Shit's Creek, yep. where <laughs> David's like... Yeah, just write it off. And his dad's like, "What do you mean, write it off?" Yeah, just just write it off. And he's like, "What do you what do you think that that means? Like, do you think it just means it doesn't exist anymore? Or are you gonna get? It's <laughs> well, okay? you're taking the chance. You're in a, in a, <laughs> some people call it the audit lottery. Yeah, you're like eh, I'm not gonna get audited. But you know, if you get audited, um, you want to be able to back up everything that's on that tax return. Right. How do you know? How do you guys determine audits? Is there any insight or is there any algorithm? Is there any? I mean, I'm sure there's no, red there, flags, there, right? There course, is a, but... um, there's something called a diff score. Yeah. And the, the score basically, um, every tax return receives a score mm-hmm. based on a variety of things. Some of it's the dollar amount. Yeah. Some of it's the type of the return. If you're just a W-2 wage earner, it's hard to cheat on your taxes. Right. Whereas if someone has a Schedule C business, mm-hmm. because they can write things off. Right. You know, or, you know, even a partnership or S Corp or things like that. Um, and then- Certain things are, are red flags, percentages. Yeah. If someone has an extremely high um, itemized deductions mm-hmm. compared to um, basically adjusted gross income, yeah. you know, you're talking like 70 or 80%. That's 
that that could cause that diff score to go up mm -hmm. because if you think about it the irs has limited resources in terms of auditors yeah and limited resources and special agents for criminal cases right we want to spend devote our time where you have the most fraud right so that's why tax returns are scored and mm -hmm. you have a higher chance of being audited if if that number's up so right. higher if you're very well you know have reporting a lot of income or a lot of expenses you uh, have a schedule c you have some weird things on there things that just are anomalies yeah. that will be more likely to be audited right. but yeah if you're a you know a 17 year old kid yeah. who's got a summer job and they have a W-2 and they put it on there and it matches. Because a lot of what the IRS does is just matching. Right, yeah. W-2s go to the to the taxpayer and then they go to the IRS mm -hmm. and they just match up. Mm -hmm. That's a waste of time to audit a 17-year-old with a summer job that made $2,000. Right. You want to go after the um, business owner who mm -hmm. has some really high deductions yeah. and things like that. What does DIFF stand for? Detection and fraud? I don't even or? Know. As soon as I said that, I'm like, what? I think I've already forgot what that meant. But I've just heard that term. Yeah, and it is kind of like an algorithm where basically right. it's a program where some very smart person has figured out where to devote those limited resources to okay. to get the highest um, bang for the buck in, in terms of just you know going where the most potential fraud is. Now, it doesn't mean there is fraud. They do the audit. Yeah. And if the person can back everything up, they move on. There you go. That's good. That's great insight, man. Thank you so much for answering that. I always kind of wondered that. You know, I think we've had conversations like, how do they just determine that? You know, now you there's know. a diff score. There's yeah, a score and I think it. there are there's a, there are some there may be a percentage that are just completely random just to catch stuff. Yeah, but the the percentage of returns are audited is just, it's minuscule compared to the total amount that's filed. Yeah, what would and you say number wise? Um, I, um, I single digit. Know. Oh, it's like under one percent. No kidding. Yeah, okay, and all that's available online. Okay. You know, if anybody was ever interested, um, everything's online about how many returns are filed, what percentages are audited, and things like that. Got you. All right, here's the last one, the last question uh, from Instagram. This is from user IW75 underscore Duke underscore MX718. I think his name's David. Ask, he wants me to ask you, why union dues and employee expenses for union workers are no longer itemizable? So there was a... Uh, Tax law change, major tax law change when President Trump was in office. And um, I think the big thing is a lot of deductions were eliminated to kind of make things simpler. Mm -hmm. So the, the biggest thing was the standard deduction basically doubled. Right. So when every taxpayer, they report your income, and then you have a choice of taking the standard deduction or mm -hmm. itemizing. Mm -hmm. And itemizing would be to add up all your... Um, like property taxes, your mortgage interest deductions, your contributions, the miscellaneous business expenses. Um, but with the standard deduction doubling, a lot less people took the itemized deduction because you take the number that's bigger. Yeah. So the standard deduction doubles, you're going to take that. For me, I used to itemize. Now I have the standard deduction. And it actually makes things easier because you don't have to keep as many records. Yeah, because that threshold's like twenty four thousand or something. Yeah, it's, now, a big, right? it's a, it's yeah, a big, it's a big for you to now. even be into the realm of getting money back from your deductions. So if you were going to itemize, you got to come up with more than twenty four thousand dollars. So I think for that specific question, that's why some of these um, uh, smaller um, d um, deductions or itemized things you could take on the itemized portion were were removed. Okay. Makes sense. But the tax laws are always changing. <laughs> that's it's, what my it's, wife would say. It's like trying to keep up like yeah. you, every year. Right? So that's why I, I highly recommend um, that people use tax software if they do things themselves. Yeah. You know, you can file online at irs.gov or, you know, use something like a TurboTax or TaxSlayer or things like that because it'll, it'll be up to date with all the latest deductions because you want to take every deduction and credit you're entitled to right you don't want to miss out on stuff yeah you just don't want to take stuff you're not entitled to absolutely right. um so you got to walk that fine line of taking as much as you can but not doing anything that's illegal but that tax software will walk you right through it yeah okay one more question i've gotten it's just a personal one what's your favorite nfl team Dallas Cowboys, America's team. America's team. You actually, if you if you actually Google America's team, it comes back as Dallas Cowboys mm. every single time. Mm. And a lot of people don't like that, but I grew up as a Cowboys <laughs> fan because you either love, <laughs> you either love or hate them, right? You either love them or hate them, but you know that's it's kind of like the Yankees, you know, yeah. or you know any other um, very successful, prominent team. Yeah. What do you see happening mm. this year, man? There's some weird stuff going on over there. 
in 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 Dallas? Yeah. Oh, who knows? Just hope springs eternal. They're undefeated right now. Everyone's undefeated, <laughs> and uh, season's starting soon. Um, <laughs> yeah. I love the NFL. Ah, yeah, me too. And college, man. I hey, Clemson and Duke game. This I transfer watch. portal thing is changing the game. Yeah, big time. But but Duke had nine wins last year. They did. They were pretty darn good. I saw a statistic then, this morning that Clemson had 32 five-star recruits and Duke had nine wow. on their team. But you got to perform on the field. Yeah. And also, that game had some turnovers in the red zone and some missed field goals, blocked yeah. field goals. Yeah, absolutely. But that was, uh, that was a little crazy. Yeah, I heard you, you were saying you like talking sports. I was like, I got to get this man talking sports before we get off the uh, podcast. Just, <laughs> sports are great. I don't yeah. know what I would do without them. Yeah, ditto. <laughs> ditto. Competition is just it's awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure having you here with us, Brian. It really has. You're always welcome back if there's anything else you want to talk about in the future. Um, if you want any of us to show up and be on something with you, be more than happy to. Oh, thanks, thanks David. This was yeah. fun. I'd definitely do it again. We'll come up with some new stuff. Awesome. I uh, just I love telling people about what we do at Rose, yeah. and uh, I love to reminisce about my career at the IRS. I yeah. never thought I'd work for the IRS. But it was it was a perfect job for me. Yeah. Before we go, let's yeah. let's tap on that. How did you end up there? Because I, I mean, like, I don't hear a lot of kids growing up go, "I go want to work for the IRS." Yeah. You know, I took one of those job survey things in middle school, and they tell you what job. It it didn't come out to IRS special agent. <laughs> um, no, I was I was in basically an economics business major in college. Okay. I, I was studying for I basically wanted to be an accountant. Mm -hmm. Wanted to work one of the big six accounting firms. Okay. And. Um, Senior year at, at UCLA, um, an IRS special agent came and spoke to our group, and he talked about how he he and um, worked with the LA County Sheriff's Office or mm -hmm. department and took down a drug organization, but did it from the money side. Right. And I was like, wow! I was always intrigued by law enforcement, but I never saw myself as a street cop. Mm -hmm. And FBI wanted two years of experience before you could even apply. Yeah. So I said, wow, this job exists. It's kind of like a combination of an accountant and a police officer. And I was like, wow, that's what I want to do. It was like, I thought it was just the perfect job for me yeah. because I got that law enforcement fix. I got to go after the bad guys, but I really thought my strength was more the financial, you know, knowledge and, and, you know, the brain power and things like that. So it, it was a great job. I was able to get on at the age of 24, which is very young. And, you um, I mean, they used to make fun of me when I first started just because my, age and I didn't have gray hair back then. <laughs> and, uh, but it, I've spent more, way more than half my life at that agency. Yeah. And I, I finally retired this summer. I could have yeah. stayed on longer, but I was, if I was honest with myself, I was, I was up for a new challenge. Right. Wanted to try some new things. Yeah. So, um, and here you are still, here, still serving. And, and the beautiful thing by transitioning to a nonprofit, I still get to do the, the PIO stuff yeah. that I did when I was a, a special agent. Right. Right. Well, Brian, thanks, it's been a David. Appreciate you for everything it. you've done, and and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Sounds good. All right, hey, want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, SellToAllen.com. If you're looking to sell your house, or you want to sell your land, or your commercial commercial real estate, quality lube and tune. If you need a quick lube service for your vehicle, reach out to them. They're over on Thornydale Road, right here by Ina. Also, visit localmiranda.com if you're looking to find a good, inclusive community online where it's safe and you can have fun, get recommendations, and share experiences of local businesses. Jump in there. Thank you.